Germans were applying with devastating logic the first principle of successful modern warfare. The strike of the enemy's air bases and deny him their use, urgent steps had to be taken to protect the defenses of our aerodromes, and for this purpose the RAF regiment was formed. Hello and welcome to our RAF Regiment in the Dofar Campaign historical podcast series. We join Wing Commander Tim Jones once again for episode three, Pressure Near the Yemen Border. So they're, um, so like their MFCs, they're more fire controllers. Were, were they were they working out the hedgehogs or were they... Um, the RAF Regiment? Yeah, I seem to recall someone telling me about a, a central fire control tower in right. Salala. Yes, no, in, no, that was in the hedgehog. Right. Um, there were, there were, in the end, I think there were five hedgehogs, uh, but they, they they didn't have mortars on each one. Right. Um, but the the principal hedgehogs had eighty one millimeter mortars manned by the RF regiment, 0.5 machine guns manned by the regiment, SF jimpies. Yeah. Um, and of course they would patrol around within the hedgehog line from there as well. Um, and there were various auxiliary army units, not RAF units, but um, Sultan's Armed Forces units, right. who also helped and did sort of local patrols and things like that. Yeah. Uh, rather like a gendarmerie or a police force. Yeah. Um, so there was a complex set of structures and people involved in all of yeah. this, but all under the same command structure. Yeah. But I saw a lot of the regiment, and they were, they were 15 squadron, 2 squadron, and... Uh, 51 squad and took it in turns to rotate and did a terrific job. And, uh, I mean, uh, test my knowledge here, more was 5.46k, is it? Um, roughly range, something like that. Roughly, uh, yeah. I should know that. <laughs> Not a Mortarman. Um, which I suppose is just about getting to the, the bottom edge of the... Bottom edge of the Jebel. So, so perhaps, you know, the loan service from the indigenous companies perhaps didn't benefit from that. Oh, I suppose so you'd have got that from somewhere else. Yeah, it depended where the contact took place because the enemy were quite good at coming down through the wadis and into the plain. So sometimes they were within that range and they'd launch a small arms attack or an RPG-7 attack. Um, beyond that range, we did have um, a Royal Artillery, not an Alt Sultan's Armed Forces uh, unit, called Cracker Battery, okay. uh, which was based at the Hedgehog Line. And they, they had artillery guns with longer range and they would fire up onto the foothills and oh, beyond. Right. Yeah. Is that the old Second World War 25 pounders? Uh, or? They had 5.5s as well. Right. So they had quite a lot good range. Yeah. And uh, they also had the... Um, we had the they had the mortar locating radar as well, which was quite helpful. That's... Different to the, the ZB. No, the ZB is a ground infiltration right, okay. radar. Right, OK. like M style. Yeah. I'm trying to think of the name. Green Archer. Right, OK, yeah. They had, and then later Cymbeline, which were mortar locating radars, which would give you an accurate prediction of where the shell had come from. So gradually it all got tightened up and rather more effective, frankly. But the, your answer to your question is, yes, the field squadron mortar fire controllers uh, were at the Hedgehogs. Uh, I think for a while a couple of them went up onto the Dianas, which were the next level of position up on the mountain. Yeah. But then the British government got nervous about them being overexposed and being dragged into the thing and it escalating. So they were back to the hedgehogs. So any, really anyone out, kind of, out of that um, RAF established commitment was you were under the SOAF banner, really, therefore it was okay to to still go and do those things, but you just weren't necessarily representing RAF. No, I was definitely not. I mean, when I went there, I didn't wear RAF regiment uniform. I wore army, infantry, local Jebel regiment uniform. Yeah. I spoke Arabic. I had a beard. I was an Arab, as far as they were yeah. concerned. And if I'd been killed, I was an Arab. Yeah. I suppose that was very important as well, going back to what we were saying at the beginning about how isolated or well, significantly isolated it was in the country prior to this. That's right. Uh, and, and also building that rapport with, with, with your men, essentially. Well, it? very much so, yes. I mean, I, I couldn't be half and half. Yeah. 
and, and you couldn't. You had to be committed because, as I mentioned earlier, as a new boy, you have to demonstrate that they can trust you and they would have faith in you. So you have mm -hmm. to actually be fully committed yeah. when they're in, a, in a, a close quarter combat situation and you can't think about it then. You've got to commit and go and do. And once that happens, you get their full support and they're fantastic, yes. Yeah, but it's, uh, it was certainly testing. Yeah, I imagine, yeah. Uh, and, and then I suppose just to put, to put it back onto Simba then, and uh, to, I imagine we'll, we'll, we'll attach some stills to this for people that are watching the video or whatnot to, to, to kind of uh, uh, work out the, the, the ground. But for those, for, for those listening, that, um, to kind of paint the picture, you've got Slala down in the, in, on the south, and then the next level out from that to the north is the, is the hedgehogs, and then you were kind of operating to the north of that again. Well, we were well north of that because the strategy changed and we, it was decided by the Sultan's armed forces that they needed to cut the enemy's su supply route from the Yemen across the border into Oman, which was feeding this rebellion. Mm. And so an imaginative operation was devised called Operation Simba. It was launched before I got there, but it was really bold, and it put a battalion 70 miles away from any other friendly forces right on the Yemen border in very difficult ground t to cut that route and it was amazingly successful to a point. They achieved phase one, they occupied the ground without any resistance, they established a small runway which they cleared, helicopter pads, resupply, new reinforcements came in, they built defensive positions, then they started getting pasted with incomers from around the border and indeed across the border. Um, they had to get down a sheer cliff of about 800 feet to the next level in order to reach the sea and cut the supply routes. Mm. They got down, the intense opposition, huge battles, and there was the expectation that they would fight, would, would locate water there. There wasn't any water mm. there. And it, resupply was very difficult because of the intensity of fire down there. And the helicopters tried and did a bit, but it was not possible. You couldn't guarantee extraction or Kazovac all resupply. So after about eight, ten days, the decision was sadly made that they had to withdraw back up that cliff again. Right. And so they withdrew back up to the main position. The enemy mined all the tracks and they didn't get back down there for nearly three years. And so for the next period, the operation had not succeeded in its last phase, right. but it was still a huge thorn in the side of the enemy and politically, a huge statement had been made and could not be unmade. Therefore, that battalion position had to be maintained. Right. Okay. And that was very important because that brought Iran into the war. They provided a battle group in the end and air support to support the Sultan. Right. Okay. And they did a huge amount and they took a lot of casualties in fighting for the Sultan okay. in those days. Huge amount. And we also had managed to secure quite a lot of surrendered enemy who began to realise that the new sultan was actually fixing the problems that caused the rebellion in the first place. He was giving you know, confidence to the Dafaris that they were secure and that they were developed and they were integrated. And so a lot of the surrendered enemy came across with information, of course, and, and served as soldiers within the Sultan's armed forces, and they were very, very good. Amazing. So we had the Iranians helping, the surrendered enemy helping, together with whatever we had in the way of RF regiment, cracker battery, seconded and loan service. The whole thing gradually altered and the balance shifted. Jordan gave a lot of help. They gave a squadron of Hawker Hunters, which enormously helped. Their special forces were there, and they're very good. Um, Jordanians produced helicopters as well, so did Saudi Arabia. So gradually, the whole position shifted over a period of about two years. And would you would you say that it would have been an unsustainable position without that sort of external help from, yes. from Iran, etc.? Yes. Et yeah. Just yeah. Yeah. It, it. I mean, personally, when I I didn't realise it, of course, but when I got there. Those things weren't in place. Yeah, and I, there were there were days shortly after I arrived when I began to think, "What on earth have I got into here? I'm never going to get out." 
working with the um, kind of surrendered forces, which would have been a, a huge ally, you know, um, because they know the ground, they know the ground, yeah. they know the tactics, yeah. they know the equipment. But was there what we'd call nowadays an insider threat, where you you know you never really know what their allegiance is or their plant or uh, nobody would say that. Yeah. But yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and, and as we've had in um, uh, Iraq and Afghan, you know, lots of incidents where, you know, Afghan national security forces have, you know, betrayed their kind of mentoring teams and, and uh, you know, there's been lots of tragic incidents where yeah. we've had this sort of green and blue insider threat, you know, yeah. and I guess it still goes on there. You mentioned um, anti-personnel mines. Um, was that uh, a constant worry to you, you know, and did you have any sort of equipment to <laughs> sort of mitigate against that? We didn't have any any real equipment. No, um, we didn't. And no, nor did we have flak jackets or anything like that. Yeah, I noticed. But, yeah, um, in the pictures, there's not one tin helmet or anything. No, you know, no, 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 no helmets. <laughs> yeah. Shorts and boots. That's not yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck it, folks. That was what I wore on my head. Right. <laughs> that's not going to protect you that, from shrapnel. That, that very one. That's that's the one. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's not the original one because I wore out. But. Uh, um, no, we didn't have very much against the mine threat, and the mine threat was horrible. And they had devastatingly effective mines. They had what we call jumping jacks, which jump up yes, to yeah, waist height. Yeah. Uh, they had plastic mines, which, yeah, which didn't pick up detect, against yeah. metal detectors. And there were, it, was a, it was a constant worry, and it caused a lot of casualties, yeah. yes. Yeah. But you just had to go through it. Yeah. You know, you just, it was a, I hated it, particularly in the monsoon. Because a helicopter couldn't come and get you if you were hit. Yeah. yeah so, that would just mean me. I mean, my troops as well. I mean, I suppose nowadays, generally, wherever you can, you know, an operation won't be mounted unless you've got a robust medical Absolutely. plan. And, and ideally, that's getting you back from point of wounding yeah. to, you know, a substantial medical team. Well, we know uh, much more about it, don't hour. we? Yes, you know that the time is sensitive. If you yeah. can fix it in that hour, you're going to survive. Uh, yeah, and, and also the motivation. We've got fewer and fewer troops, so you can't expend troops. You need to recover them and get them back into battle. And you, and you need people before they'll even join to know that you're committed to getting them out if they get hurt. I mean, um, what, was the, what was the medical provisions? What, you know, was there somewhere yeah. in the back of your mind? You knew you could get yeah. back somewhere? And yeah, we had, a, we had a field, an FST, a field surgical team of Brits. Oh, OK. RAF. Navy and Army in rotation at Salala. There was a brilliant FST, um, and the helicopter pilots would be dedicated to bringing bringing people back to yeah. the FST. And when I was injured, that I could, they flew me back to the FST. It wasn't the last ditch thing. It wasn't life or death, but I had to go and get fixed. And they flew me back to the FST, and it was brilliant. They, I must admit, they were fabulous people. And dedicated, and they knew what they were doing, and that that and it was not just because it was a, I was a Brit. I mean, they do this for the soldiers, well, of course, yeah, yeah. and mostly for the soldiers. And they fixed some amazing things. And there was a whole industry making artificial legs out of broomsticks. And, really, you know, <laughs> you'd be amazed. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I suppose it's fair to say a lot of um, medical. Um, science is pioneered from the battlefield. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Even now. You know, some some of the equipment that sort of come out of Afghan, which I believe is now used sort of mainstream NHS. And a lot of stuff that was pioneered in Northern Ireland has been used now in mainstream combat surgery. Yeah. The Falklands experience taught people a lot. Yeah. So, you know, it keeps improving. The sad truth is you can't fight a war without casualties. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have sort of... Um, a healthy degree of medical training, not necessarily yourself as a company commander, but people within your company which you could rely on. To... I, I had a medic with each uh, platoon. Um, I had, we had an Indian doctor who had five years combat experience in India, oh, wow. India oblique China, yeah. who was very good, uh, and he'd come forward if necessary. Um, we all carried, um, what do you morphine. call it, Atra uh, morphine. Yeah. Morphine tabs, uh, the injectors on an, on our ID tags. Um, you'd always use his, not yours. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, but no, you didn't have extensive medical training. I mean, there was one contact where one of uh, one of the Brits who was a good guy. 
I went in to support him with the brigade reserve. And he, I got out of the helicopter, dashed up, could see him, and he was under fire. He, I wasn't, he was up on the hill. And he called me over and he said, Jonesy, I've been hit. Can you get up and patch me up? I cried. Wriggled up to him. His water bottle had been hit. Right. And he and was dribbling water down his leg. <laughs> he was bloody busy because he was his, his number two had been wounded, and so he was busy firing. And I said, <laughs> I knew him quite well, and said to him, "It's not serious. I'll patch you up." And I put a shell dressing on the, where the water bottle was. And tied him up. Oh, thanks, mate. Thanks, mate. And then I legged it off to go and do whatever we were doing. And about five minutes later, he got, "Hello, Grey Three Nine. This is Sand Three Nine. Out. <laughs> <laughs> but no, the answer is we all we were conscious of the risks. We do what we can. Our medics were quite good, yes, and they were brave. Um, unfortunately, we had to use them quite often. Yeah. Um, uh, talking about some of the equipment, which it didn't wear protective equipment, we'd, we'd turn the CPE, uh, combat protective equipment, uh, out in Afghan, there was a significant IED risk as opposed to AP mines, but, you know, same, same, same end product. Mm. Um, we would all wear a thing called a called a combat nappy, so yeah. it's like flat jacket material, like a jock strap, which yeah. kind of clip round you. And I wore it religiously, but but a lot lot of guys didn't wear it. And I just think, you know, you should have done. You should have yeah. done. But yeah. not everyone did all yeah. of the time. And I think, that's your crown jewels. Well, we didn't you know, you're like, why would you not yeah. wear that? Well, we, we, didn't, yeah, yeah. We, we didn't have that luxury <laughs> yeah. or option. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, some horrific, horrific wounds, horrific wounds out of all these guys. And, and as a result, you know, w w w wars, war, wars can be fun, you know, and it can be thrill-seeking, but, you know, in the, in the snap of your fingers, you know, something... Oh, absolutely. You know, life-changing happens. No, we all make light of it, and these days in, you know, distance lens enchantment, it's all, you know, I look back on it now and I did enjoy it. God, there were days when I was so frightened I couldn't believe it. Yeah, yeah, I'd imagine, yeah, yeah. No, we were lucky. I think a lot of us were lucky. Uh, some still some guys with serious injuries from there. Yeah, I'd imagine. And you're, you're still very much in contact with a lot of the people. Yes, well, yeah. uh, since coming back, I've remained very much in touch with Oman. I now edit their armed forces journal, so I go out there on visits. I've been out there every three years or so, ever since I left on loan service. Yeah. And I've stayed friendly with them. I've met some of my old soldiers who are now grandfathers and they've met their families and all the rest of it and I love it I think it's a fabulous country and they are very indebted to what we did to help them mm. and they remember yeah which is nice you yeah. feel good about it and also when I look at the country I think God, in a tiny way I had a hand in that yeah well it sounds like you had a hand in a way in lots of things um, which could have developed into much bigger problems you know had you not yeah. been there at the time, um, what was the story we were talking about earlier where you had to snatch a, snatch a guy from a building? And oh, that was before Dofar. Right, was that Aden? No, no, that was in Oman right. when we first deployed and we were training to go down to the war. Um, we got a, we'd just finished the exercise, it was Christmas Eve, 72. We got a message saying, withdraw blank, issue live, orders in 20 minutes. And the colonel flew in in a helicopter and we had to uh, cordon and search a major small town urgently because there was a planned coup about to take place the next day. So, and he had, there had been intelligence information that this, this particular guy, amongst others, was a key guy yeah. and he had to be snatched and yeah. interrogated by the intelligence guys. So we had to go and find him and snatch him. So we went in to snatch him. We didn't know any of the right kit you know, and you didn't. You were thinking on your feet as you went. Yeah. The boys had not rehearsed this, and there wasn't time. So we got into the town, and eventually there was a three-story building, and the guy was asleep on the second floor, apparently. Anyway, there was an entrance. But it was a big, solid, thick door. We didn't have anything to blow it with, so we we thought maybe we'll blow it with a 60 mil mortar, which would have been a bit of a disaster, <laughs> slight overkill. Anyway, fortunately, we thought, well, let's see if it's open, and it was. So we got in, the two entry men went in, bang. I went in with a pistol. We didn't know what we were going to find. And inside, it was the ground floor, full of goats, with poo everywhere. 
and bang and bang and bang and hurricane lamps lit up and an old lady stirring a pot of halwa, which is a bit like Turkish delight, and several other pots and a couple of kids sitting on a pole, one of whom fell in the pot. Fortunately, it wasn't the hot pot. Fell in this, and one of my soldiers immediately, he's a village boy, farmer, his instinct was not to rush and carry on with the mission. His instinct was to save this little child. So he rushed over and grabbed him, picked him up like a chocolate-covered ant. This guy was <laughs> dripping in sticky, sweet goo. And you're trying to get up the stairs, get the guy, grab him out of the bed, get on with the mission. And we did, and we got the guy in fine. And as a result of him and others, the coup was prevented by the skin of our teeth. Uh, but it was a series of ops that went like that. And mine was just part of it. But it was a serious wake-up wake call on Christmas Eve, I have to say. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed that and would like to hear more, then please tune in for more of the Wing Commander Jones in Episode 4, Offensive Night Ops and Final Protective Fire.